raw materials, raw materials. Experts have also been drawing attention to the fact that some of those raw materials are available locally. They and can't. that sometimes you have to apply for forex, it's a way of capital flight. The Naira parallel rate over a thousand Naira. Uh, I are in window, I don't know, seven or something if you get the money. So how is this going to now put additional pressure on forex? Again, if you just use the simple economic matrix of demand and supply. You say, and again, uh, impact on you know, the, the capacity of our local manufacturers. The, uh, our, our local manufacturers have been campaigning you know, um, for, I mean, support, government support in the area of provision of forex. You know, now, opening this window, puts a lot of pressure on them. Um, well, that's uh, Kingsley. Kingsley, thank you for the points that you raised there. Thanks just a lot. before, yes, just before we end, I just like for us. I don't know if the camera can get a, you know this picture for us. It's um, a, a woman. Kingsley, you want to see? Um, it's just a, a, a woman. I, I thought you um, invited the camera. Yes, the camera. It's well, about zoom if it yes. If, zoom if the shot. camera can zoom in. Okay, tell us what yes. it's all about. It's it's a, a woman there. A, apparently, a trader. Uh, she has her stuff there. You can see. Uh, you know, everything is just um, upside down. Uh, the plate is upside down. The crate of egg there it doesn't seem to have been sold. Uh, of course, she had a, a carton of noodles, and but she's sleeping. I mean, this this picture is um, it tells a whole lot of story. Uh, thank you, camera. How much is on egg now? <laughs> thank you, camera. You're asking me. Do you know whether I still uh, I bought eggs? <laughs> So, I mean, these are, these, so, are the, these are the issues uh, to worry about. I'm yes. sure that this, there will be a lot of conversation around this matter because there were persons who said part of the reason was yes. develop your mm. local capacity. It, it's just basic issues. That there are, if we have shortfalls yes. on some items, trade, fiscal and monetary authorities could say, okay, this is what we need to do. We need to allow a window for these items to come in. I, I, are, you, are you following? But, the crate of egg is 2,200. Absolutely. Chukwede, yeah. thank you. Um, I mean... We can only talk. They no, said but they're making we an only, impact, please. We can only use our pen and our microphones. Journalism should never uh, give up, please. Uh, never, ever. So we have done our part. The, the rest is left for uh, the mandated authorities to do their part as well. Chukudi Okoli Ubaja, Elias so Chukst the Boy. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend. I feel good. And see you on Monday. Bye. <laughs> All right, let's go for a short break. <laughs> All right, welcome again, and you're watching Good Morning Nigeria. It's happening live on the network service of the NTA. Today, our conversation will focus on coping with mental health. For starters, let's listen to Ibrahim Ben Amidu, background report. In today's fast paced and unpredictable world, it is important to recognize that tough times can have a profound impact on mental health. The pressures of work, financial worries due to the ongoing economic uncertainties coupled with relationship difficulties have all left many battling with anxiety, depression, and other mental health conditions, but the good news is that help is available. Psychologists in Nigeria recommend seeking professional help as an essential step towards getting better. These mental health professionals like therapists and counselors can provide guidance and therapeutic techniques to manage stress, anxiety, and other mental health concerns. The experts in this field also advise connecting with support groups online or in person, which can be immensely beneficial because sharing experiences, hearing others' stories, and building a support network of understanding individuals creates a strong foundation for mental well-being. Clinical psychologists have said the human mind is incredibly adaptable and by engaging in physical activities like exercise, sports, or just a walk in nature while taking a deep breath of fresh air can lift your mood and release stress. Making these activities a part of your routine, according to them, can have lasting positive effects on mental health. Most importantly is nurturing healthy relationships and spending quality time with loved ones after recharging one's mind from routine activity. Supportive relationships provide a sense of comfort as opposed to isolation that can exacerbate mental health challenges. 
Experts say it is important to remember you are not alone and there are numerous resources available at your disposal, like reaching out to mental health hotlines, support networks, or speak to a health care provider in times of darkness. All right, thank you very much, Dan Hamidu, for that background. Uh, with us in the studios, uh, we have uh, regular guests on Good Morning Nigeria, but we'd like to specially welcome to our headquarters studios this morning. Our viewers uh, who have watched him on the program would know that we always take him from uh, the city of Seven Hills, uh, and that's the bad one. So this morning, we have with us here um, Dr. Jabril Abdul Malik, a consultant psychiatrist and founder of Sido Foundation. Dr. Abdul Malik, we're glad to have you in our studios this morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, our viewers. Okay. Also here with us in the studios this morning, would like to uh, again specially welcome Chinyere Ugo Onyekwere, a clinical psychologist at NIM Foundation. And the welcome is especially special uh, because the last time uh, she was with us on the program, uh, she looked different. Now uh, she's ready for another. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm, 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 I'm curious. I'm curious. I, 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 want, I, want to, I want to know. I, I want to know. Just no, no, huh? no, 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 not, not exactly for public consumption. Thank you. <laughs> All right, whatever it is, congratulations. <laughs> I think I have an idea, though. Yes, but Chime Asanye, JD founder at Nigerian Mental Health, is also here with us, and um, he'll also be speaking. Uh, to this issue. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's glad to be here. All right. And uh, we now take you to our Ibadan studio where we have in Yito Alexander Shenge. Uh, I was tempted to say Shenge, but I know it's Shenge, uh, professor of psychology, University of Ibadan. And um, he's also a professor of industrial and organizational psychology, pioneer chairman of the Nigerian Psychological Association. And we're very happy to have you join us for this conversation. Good morning, Nigeria. All right, so, so lady and, and gentlemen, uh, this is not the first time we are focusing on uh, issues of mental health uh, in, in the country. But we know that uh, times do change, uh, and the times we are in, and some would uh, describe the times as pretty tough, and they say that tough times don't last, but that tough people uh, do uh, get on in the long term. But how do you cope with that toughness? How well are we coping with our mental health pressures at the moment? Dr. Abdul Malik, let's begin with you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, the challenges that we are facing now are indeed overwhelming because we've gone through a transition and we are also facing a lot of economic challenges with um, the, especially when the fuel price went up with the spiral effect on the cost of living across every other sector. That's a huge challenge for the entire society at various levels. Families, school fees have gone up, mm -hmm. cost of transportation to get to work has gone up, cost of basic commodities have gone up, and yet remunerations have not commensurately increased. So that's a huge challenge for parents and the children who are also feeling the pinch. Now, this is aside the fact that globally, the entire economy globally is facing knocks and shocks. The spiral effects of the war in Ukraine on wheat and other things, it's having a global impact. So it's not just our local challenges. And when you superimpose all of this, on the fact that the traditional sources of social support, the family system, the extended family network, the uh, religious sources of support that we traditionally had as you know pillars that shocked, propped us up, we are beginning to lose the essence of those traditional, based on our society and our culture, sources of support. Growing up a couple of years ago, decades ago, Every child could walk into any home on the streets and get fed and play and fall asleep 
and then when it's evening and your parents haven't seen you, they will just go knocking. Or they, we didn't have mobile phones then. Or they will just come around and say, oh, your child is sleeping in our house. So, and so it was that sort of communal support system. It took the village to bring up people. But now we all have our erected prisons, you know, walls and fortresses. You don't even know who your next door neighbor is. You don't know their children. You don't, you, you don't trust people enough to allow your children go and spend the day next door. So we are losing these traditional buffers that we had in society. Yet the shocks, both global and local, are coming in you know, waves and waves. And so it is not surprising that many people are struggling. For instance, young people, to just to highlight the age category of young people, they have thousands of friends on Facebook and social media. But they are so lonely, they don't have someone that will genuinely have their back. Because we think once you're on social media, you're playing with your gadgets, you are connected. But in reality, the friends that will really have their back, it's not there. Parents are busy hustling. Go out early, come back late, children are left to their devices and their gadgets. So these are the various things that are weakening our ability to buffer and cope with the shocks. And that's why it's not surprising that our mental health um, levels are plummeting. And we are seeing people across all age categories having a lot of stress and difficulties with their mental health. Thank you. And, and, and in fact, that just um, uh, probably captures you know, my, my question. And I'm directing my questions to Chin Lugo. The compartmentalization of all that you describe as mental health seem to capture almost every condition that all people, you know, uh, experience. And, and the fear is, ha, does it mean everybody has mental health challenge? Even natural reactions like, you know, being anxious and all that is also within this compartment. So I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, what, what is the, is, is, is there, are there degrees, you know, maybe anxiety, for instance, it's included here. Are there degrees, you know, of mental health? So definitely there are. I think one of the first things I'll say is this is the reason why we ask people to not self-diagnose. Because if you do, you put yourself in more harm. And the reason is that we all sometimes experience symptoms of mental health challenge. Sometimes we feel anxious. Sometimes we feel sad. Sometimes we feel like we're under stress or pressure. It does not mean you have a mental health challenge. It does not mean you have a diagnosis or you have a disorder. You might have symptoms here and there. I can remember when I was um, studying and I'd go through the, um, I used the DSM when I was, when I was trained and I was like, oh, that's me. Any, so any uh, mental health challenge, I say, ah, I can relate to this. What? Yes. I can relate to this. So you could relate to everything. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all on a spectrum. Okay. And it's not just one thing that is because you're having a headache and then you have malaria. There are other things behind it. So it's by the time you have a specialist sit down with you and have a conversation and, give, and you give like a proper history, you give like proper information of what you're presenting with, then we can understand the severity, understand is it impacting your relationship? your ability to go to work, your studies, um, how much of an impact are these challenges having? That would put you on a spectrum. That would put you, you know, give you, say, okay, you're at this level, you're at this level. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes it will clear things up for you and say, maybe it's not really what you think it is because you could be presenting with A, B, C, and D, but it's not really what you think it is. Mm -hmm. And you could get the right diagnosis if, you know, if it's there. So again, please... Don't self-diagnose. I know Google is your friend, but Google no, can mislead Google. you. Ah, no, 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 no. No, but I don't <laughs> want me, so I don't even, I don't even try. Yes. Right. I don't try. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, two years ago, for uh, that intervention. Chima, let's, let's come back again uh, to, if you may, the, the whole essence of trying to be tough in tough times mm. uh, and what that disposition does to the mental health of first the individual, the community, and the society. I'm listening to Dr. Abdul Malik and the advisory by uh, Tinyerogo against self-diagnosis. 
Uh, well, I mean, I, it, uh, unless, of course, you, you are looking very prosperous, so you are not on that page. <laughs> you, you are looking very, you are looking very prosperous. So, but everyone, if you are having to balance, yeah. your balance your personal and family budgets. Mm -hmm. You know what it is. You're yes. not sure what the next week or month might you be. Have. What does that do to you in, in, in the first instance? And what are the coping mechanisms? Are people coping well? Yeah. So we have to, if we look at it, you, you said something that um, Dr. Malik was discussing, some of the social economic challenges that we're facing, whether it's the from the war in Ukraine, to the cash crunch or people can't get money um, or the hyperinflation. So people are challenged. And if you actually look at studies, it says there was one study by Africa Polling Institute and MANI, which is Mentally Aware Nigerian Initiative. And it said that almost three quarters of Nigerians are facing acute levels of stress and anxiety. Acute levels. So the majority of Nigerians are actually facing issues of mental health and challenges. You mentioned that I'm looking prosperous, and I think that is, that's interesting that, that you mentioned it, but I, I, I think that it's important that we talk about men for a second, especially when it comes to toughness, right? Mm. Because um, men face a unique challenge with mental health. In this challenging economic, we're supposed to be the providers, right? We're supposed to be the ones that are helping our family and friends, and yet we can't, the cost of living has doubled and tripled, right? People don't know what to do. Um, there are just, you might have seen the um, images recently in Lagos of a couple of attempted suicides on a bridge, unfortunately, and they're all men, either trying to hang themselves and things like that, things that we don't encourage, but just showing that the times are tough, unfortunately, for individuals and people don't know what to do. So I think it's important that we talk to each other and make sure people know that it's okay not to be okay, that it's okay to ask friends. and. Um, there's been really good campaigns for individuals, especially men, to say, hey, can you check on your brother? Because as guys, we don't want to talk about our challenges, our issues that we're facing with each other. We don't want to discuss um, that it's hard, whether it's relationships or finances and things like that. And so we look at whether it's Sniper or whatever, different products to try to end things. And we can't. We need to make sure that we don't look at any particular vehicles and that we know that there's relief, that there's support out there for individuals. So it's not about how you look, right? It's not about how you look because in a second you can have a case, a psychosis, you can have a trigger, right? And so it's not about how you look at the present time, it's about how you can cope with these things. And so one of the things I would like to point people to is that if they are having challenges right now, these tough times are, we have our organization, which is um, Nigeria Mental Health, we have our website, www.nigeriamentalhealth.org, and on it, we have crisis hotlines if you just need somebody we, to talk we, we, to. We, we, will, we, will, we will allow you to do that yes. as, as, as we get into the conversation, surely. Sure. Um, yes, that's, that's very important. Uh, but let, let's bring in uh, Professor of Psychology, uh, Alexander Schenge, now into the conversation. I, when Chime talked about uh, the fact that, you know, uh, men are supposed to be the, um, you know, providers, you know, and, and, and all that. I, I agree with him partially. Uh, that may be so in the past, but now uh, there's a shared responsibility on all fronts, you know, between the man and the woman. So everyone is out there, like, uh, you know, Dr. Abdul Malik said earlier, and everyone is out there, you know, trying to make ends meet, both the, the man and the woman. So I think responsibilities are now shared. And I, I even want to believe that, you know, the female gender bear, you know, higher responsibility. Now that's in addition to her domestic, uh, uh, you know, responsibilities. But be that as it may, uh, Prof, uh, if you look at the statistics of attempted suicide, you know, those who attempted suicide, the male gender appeared to be, you know, uh, um, higher. So is there a propensity for men to be more susceptible to mental illness than the women? Thank you very much. Um, well, let me start by saying that uh, uh, any, anyone can uh, have a mental health challenge. And uh, so it's a matter of uh, uh, how vulnerable um, they may be, how susceptible they may be. And uh, as you rightly said, um, men and women play their roles 
in different ways. In modern times, responsibilities are shared. Now, even then, uh, by and large, uh, one can say that uh, uh, the, the, the pressure, pressure on, uh, on men uh, in some cases, I say in some cases, of course there is pressure on, on, on women also in a number of cases, but uh, the pressure on men in Africa, in Nigeria, uh, is uh, uniquely different in some cases. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they are expected to, to carry out this, uh, play out uh, these roles, uh, sometimes without even uh, complaining. Uh, because uh, when you complain, you are a weak man, you cannot take care of yourself. So these are issues that uh, weigh people down. In fact, in some cultures, men, mustn't, men shouldn't weep. Uh, that is an uh, emotional expression. So uh, when you are weighed down, it's not that you are, you, you are going to be a weeping man, but then there are times that uh, you should express yourself emotionally and not uh, uh, bottle up emotions uh, over time. Um, so it is not that uh, uh, men are, uh, are more um, uh, inclined to have mental uh, illnesses, uh, but it is that uh, the, the environment is such that uh, makes things uh, very difficult for them in particular ways. And of course, it makes it difficult for women in their own particular ways. There are uh, 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 differences uh, as far as gender is concerned. And uh, all of these things, like uh, the, uh, the other speaker said, they, they lie on the continuum. Mental illness lies on the continuum. So it is not that uh, you know, one, one person is completely free from it and another one is not free from it. So we need to be doing this check uh, of ourselves and of others uh, from time to time. Uh, we, we need to uh, look at our uh, cultural practices and cultural beliefs. We need to uh, address a, a, a number of issues, uh, for instance, the issue of stigma, that uh, comes uh, from uh, cultural beliefs and then the associated discrimination that uh, uh, follows stigma and all of this, and which again leads to what I call uh, uh, mental health uh, inequity. You know, uh, where there should be mental health uh, equity and there should be access for all people. And when we look at mental health in this country, there's a way we, we just concentrate on uh, people who are on the road, and people who are uh, lying in psychiatric uh, hospitals, mental health facilities. No, there are many other people who are uh, suffering from mental health challenges at work, in the family, on the roads, and people drive everywhere. So we should recognize all these uh, uh, issues and then try to provide help. Dr. Dumalik has rightly said earlier that uh, the social support system in Africa, in Nigeria, is winning, is dying, and that is very unfortunate. Because the Western people knew us, global Western people knew us for our social support. And this social support is going down by the day. The issue of trust is a big issue, and that is making people to have a lot of uh, issues in relationship, a lot of issues in uh, and relating with people, and it's affecting um, the nation and the uh, units and individuals and families in so many other ways. So this issue of discrimination, this issue of, uh, of, of, of stigma, and uh, many of these uh, associated things should be checked. In hospitals, uh, stories have been told of people who, you know, you know sometimes people who are, are discriminated uh, again in certain ways, maybe because of their condition. Sometimes people have special needs and they are, uh, you know, they are not attended to. Sometimes uh, people don't have resources, and then the those who have resources are, are preferred in terms of even admitting uh, those uh, uh, patients in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the facilities. One last thing I want to add in this case is, uh, you know, looking at these things and then trying to bring about holistic so solutions, and uh, which means that uh, the different uh, mental health uh, experts have to work together. Psychiatrists have to work well with clinical psychology, with uh, social uh, uh, um, uh, social um, work, uh, workers, and with uh, 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 counselors and with different people. Uh, if we don't do that, then um, charlatans will take over, as they have actually taken over in many cases. You have people who are not trained coming in because the professionals that are supposed to be uh, uh, rendering holistic services are busy fighting themselves within. It's not just with uh, 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 the mental health sector, but with other sectors, uh, health sectors, or uh, health uh, 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 subunits also. So we need to look at it. Then the issue of uh, you know, government care, government funding, 
the issue of uh, 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 financing. There are so many issues that are weighing us down. Then the issue of uh, people generally not uh, having a positive outlook on life. You know, this is part of what we are, uh, the challenges that we are having today. Uh, we, we chase a lot of things. We have many goals that we want to, uh, to, to, to accomplish. People are, 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 are hustling here and there. And they cannot, uh, you know, uh, they want to achieve everything at once. Uh, it does not work out like that. You have to I have a, a good... Professor Schenge, thank you very much there for uh, your initial comments. We'll come back to you in the course of the conversation. Now back to the, the, the studios. One of the issues that uh, Professor Schenge uh, talked about, we can all try to loop it into this whole conversation of coping with mental health against the backdrop of uh, some of the um, uh, points that you had each made, uh, Chinyere warning us against self-diagnosis. Uh, my colleague and I, at the commencement of the, of the program, did say that you don't have to be a vagrant and naked uh, before you are diagnosed uh, with uh, mental health. But we also say, seek help. When will an individual know that, uh, or recognize, or when will a neighbor know that an individual needs help. You've also talked about the spectrum, that it is from one end to the other, maybe from the lowest intensity to the highest intensity. Dr. Abdulmalik, I'd like you to come in here uh, and then it let our viewers into uh, what to watch out for, what to look out for, and then when to go knocking at the door of an expert. Um, thank you very much. And I think that um, just to build on what Chinye Rugo had said earlier about the spectrum, you know, if you have physical symptoms, like you have headache, you have fever, they say you can use paracetamol. If symptoms don't improve after three days, see your doctor. So similarly for mental health, there are three distinguishing criteria that separate what is within the range of normal from what is abnormal. So one of them is severity. Everybody, for instance, has good days, bad days. Nobody is happy every day. Nobody should also be sad every day. So the majority of us, we fluctuate. Some days you jump out of bed, you are eager and excited. Some days you struggle to drag yourself out of bed. You just don't feel the energy. And, you know, so this is normal. We talk about abnormality when, number one, the symptoms are so severe and overwhelming. For instance, um, let's say I came with a car here, and then after this program I go out and the car is no longer there. You know, in some instances, you actually start searching inside the gutter, looking for <laughs> the car. You know, because you can't believe that the car that the you found here is there. no longer there. That's right. You know, and if that happens to any of us, you will not be happy. You will be sad. You may have to go to the police station and so on. That's understandable that you are sad because this has happened. But if your reaction is so severe, for instance, you then go out and you remove your clothes, start rolling on the floor and kicking your feet like a two-year-old throwing a tantrum, that your car goes, ah, this is beyond the pale. Now we understand your car, but this is your reaction. So the severity of symptoms and reactions is one indicator that tells us that this is going beyond the pill. The second criteria is duration, how long the symptoms last for. So if your car is stolen, you don't have an appetite, you're not sleeping well, that's understandable. But if for one month you are refusing to eat, you are refusing to sleep and so on because your car was stolen, that duration makes it, raises a red flag and makes people begin to say, come oh, this is getting beyond the norm. For instance, again, if you are bereaved, you've lost a loved one, naturally, bereavement reactions, grief reactions will set in. But if the duration, the person is not eating, not going out, not doing anything for longer than society would expect to be within, of course, it varies from person to person, but I'm just underlining mm -hmm. the fact that duration mm -hmm. of how long these things last is also a second mm -hmm. criteria. Now, the third one is where your day-to-day -day functioning becomes impaired. You are no longer able to function. You come to the office, you open your laptop, you are looking at the screen, and the screen is looking at you. Productivity zero. You go to class as a student, the lecturer is talking and your mind is not there. Your attention and concentration is poor. Your productivity is poor. Your social relationships nosedives. You know, you become reclusive, you withdraw. 
you are no longer responding to calls or messages or going to class or showing up at work or going for it. So functioning is also another key area. So these three are the major criteria that distinguishes what is normal from what is abnormal. And all of us, once your loved ones, your close ones who know you intimately begin to worry, I think we should pay attention. If someone close to you says, you've not been yourself lately, I noticed something, don't be dismissive. Because mm. they know your baseline they, level of normal personality routine. and routine. Mm. And they are the ones that will be, because sometimes we may not notice anything. Mm. It's people close well, to you that will tell you that, you know, you've become withdrawn some, these days. Is there anything the matter? And that may be what will bring it to your attention for the first time. But again, I will end by saying that, if you are not sure, once there is any reason for concern, please see a mental health professional. I like, I like, I like, I like your your explanation. Thank you, Doctor Abdul Malik. That puts a lot of things into perspective. I would also like us to uh, drive, you know, this further. But uh, I, 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 I would like you, you know, to explain further to us. Uh, some of these triggers, because a lot of people, um, you know, confuse certain things. For instance, menopause, you know, common with women. Uh, it comes with a lot of mood swings and anxiety. Um, I also like you to look at the workplace. We talk about stress. Look at the workplace. I mean, how can the workplace attitude and dispositions trigger or, you know, affect mental health? So I think in all honesty, anything could be a trigger for anybody. Um, it depends on the person. It depends on the interpretation of the situation. Um, as Dr. Adamali gave earlier, the example of you come out and you don't see your car. Mm -hmm. For some people, they'll be like, okay, let's look at it a different way. For, for another person, it would raise your high, your blood pressure. It would make you so worried. You would go into a spiral. So it depends on the individual and the interpretation of what the problem, of what of the situation. Um, they stress everywhere. They stress in the workplace. They stress when you wake up. You can feel stress. So anything can actually cause it again. It depends on the individual, your interpretation of the situation. One of the things I find is that I, as I adults, specifics. I, I like especially at the workplace because yes. a lot of people who you know, exhibit some of those conditions, are, are, you know, workers. Yeah. So are there things within the workplace now, you know, that we should be concerned about? Occupational yes. Okay, yes. yes, definitely. One of the things in the workplace will be bullying. Um, a lot of us, ex well, not of us, <laughs> a lot of people experience bullying in the workplace. Um, Ill treatment in the workplace. Um, when you are talking down on somebody, when you're mistreating somebody, when you are... Um, working with someone, giving the person conditions that are not favorable, that are not humane. And sometimes you find that in workplace, we take away the human factor and we focus on just do the work, just do the work. And you forget that you're working with a human being who's very dynamic and that we don't take that into account. So a lot of people feel the pressure from the workplace. You're going to the mm. workplace to help you um, get the resources to sustain your life, to sustain your family. And then the workplace is supposed to be the place where you go and get your source of living, it's a source of stress for you also. So things like this in the workplace, when you have um, a space where people are not being treated like human beings, when you have a place where people are talked down, no, you're always raising your voice, you're always shouting, sometimes you might even be fighting. There's always quarreling, backbiting. Um, all these experiences in the workplace can be very triggering for people. When people also feel that they're not treated fairly in the workplace, when the work they put in is not commensurate to the money that they get in, that could actually be a stressor for the person. So all these places that do not take into account the, the individual, you just don't see the individual, they should just come and do the work and go. For, for a person in the workplace, that can be very triggering. Work hours, sometimes they can be long and not everybody can adjust to that. Um, I know that it's a lot difficult for us to get work in Nigeria, but even as people in the workplace, even as people in places of authority, I think it's important to look at the human being too. Um, while you're trying to be productive, which is 
the primary function on having an, um, an office, opening a business, is productivity. But the people who help you get that productivity, they're dynamic. They're not structured like that. So it's important to also um, take emotional needs into consideration. Their social needs into consideration. When you treat people like human beings, they'll bring out their best and they'll do the best for the business. Mm. You haven't talked about <clears throat> menopause. <laughs> menopause? Yes. <laughs> What about menopause do you want to make, can I ask? Yes, because a, a, a lot of people say when you get into that stage, it yes. comes with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, mood changes, a lot of anxiety and, and, and all that. So how do those, you know, uh, conditions relate with their mental health? So definitely. Um, I think also one thing about mental health is that there's a biological component to it. Um, and that biological component, when we, women go through menopause, it's a hormonal change. Um, that goes on in the body. So, yes, there are instances where people can develop um, panic attacks. There are instances where people can develop depression even, mm -hmm. develop different forms of anxiety that come with it. Um, so because of those switches and those changes that take place, different things can come up. Mm -hmm. And for different people, anything can come up. You can see the same also in adolescence. Um, usually the onset of a lot of mental health challenges is in the adolescent age. And that's the period when we are, progr you know, we are moving from one stage to the other. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of hormonal activity, mm -hmm. surge, a decrease. And the same thing also replicates itself in menopause when there's a lot of change. Also in pregnancy, you can see that there's a lot of hormonal changes. Things are moving. So when things move, you know, when foundation moves, things mm -hmm. can drop. And things can, if, you know, everything can, no, not, not, things not, can not, happen. Now we see that women, it's like an F, it's like an F, it's like an F. Chime, you now see that the women are more, I mean, dis, disposed to, you know. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> fine, that's fine. But, but I, I don't know, I, 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 I'm going to get a pay school fees last month. But, <laughs> Dr. Abdul Malik, I, I, I know you are itching to say something, but let, let me throw this in. Yeah. Uh, because some, it can be a very elastic term. And then using the analogy of a missing car, uh, we also see it play out in everyday, everyday occurrence. Okay, the gentleman parks a vehicle somewhere, he comes out, he doesn't find the vehicle, and then all of a sudden he's checking in the gutter to see whether the vehicle is there, or begins to uh, throw his uh, tantrums. But you also see in the road crash, when because of our sometimes reckless nature of driving, you hit another person's car. Uh, it is said it's a, as a joke, but that's actually what plays out. Uh, when you hit a, a big man's car, it will say that, oh, you hit my car. <laughs> but if you hit a poor man's car, it say you hit me. I, I don't know whether you get it. Say so you hit my car. The other one says, you hit me. And it probably walking in the cell would I be, where will I get money to fix this car? Which leads me to that elastic term, poverty. Yes. As I said, poverty is very elastic. But does economic or financial uncertainty for a duration, as Abdul Malik pointed out, for a prolonged duration, can it be a trigger for one of the mental health issues on the spectrum? Of course it can. Of, of, of course it can. Um, poverty and mental health in a lot of times are linked. In fact, they say that a lot of the, um, individuals who are most economically deprived face mental health challenges and issues. And unfortunately, um, most of the individuals who have lack access to care are in the low and middle income countries because we don't have the psychiatrists, we don't have the psychologists and things like that. So there's a there's an intimate link. If you look at Nigeria right now, we're ranked 95th in the World Happiness in Index. Mm -hmm. That means that we're in the bottom third in terms of relative happiness um, specific to other countries. So um, poverty is one of the challenges because unfortunately it's kind of like a, almost like hypertension. It's something that you're always thinking about, whether it's the challenge of money or the challenges, where's the next thing going to um, go towards. And unfortunately in a country like Nigeria, we see people blowing every day, but the masses are not. There's a study by the UNICEF, and they said that Nigerian children face the most pressure to succeed more than our parents, because we see the most opulence in our country. We see, whether it's the Burner Boys, the David Doe's, or, you know, we see ourselves doing successful. We see our peers doing successful, whether they're going to different countries, but the masses aren't. So that reality 
of what we're experiencing is very different than the lived reality of most individuals that are challenged here. So there's a intimate link to access. But I also wanted to touch on this question you ask about work mm -hmm. as well, um, too, because you can think about work in terms of triggers um, and generically, but you also have to think about the type of work. We're talking, you have individuals who are mental health specialists here, um, but the work you do also contributes to the mental health triggers, right? So whether if you're, especially if you're a specialist, if you're hearing traumatic stories, it's hard, right? You're taking that trauma, those stories home with you every day. We, we had during COVID, for instance, people, the nurses, Dilling and um, other individuals, the doctors, seeing mortality every day, them going to their communities and some people feeling like, oh, maybe they have COVID because we've been working at a specialist hospital. That kind of trauma causes mental health conditions. So it's very important that mental health specialists take them care of themselves first responders, you know, whether if you're in an emergency situation, things like that, take care of themselves. And that is often not considered a lot in the work that we do. We, the, the truth is that in things where there's social challenges, we need to mainstream mental health, right? So whether it's in our responses to humanitarian disasters, we saw what happened the other day in Sudan. We were actually approached to help see a lot of the uh, refugees and things like that that are migrating back to Nigeria, can we mobilize individuals for them? But early on, especially um, this only more recently, that government has been mainstreaming mental health and mental health support in terms of our humanitarian and social dynamics. So we need to do that. We need to think about mental health and mainstream it in, in poverty, whether in crisis, whether in um, farmer herder conflict. We need to understand that mental health and well being is something that needs to be cut across all these important areas. Otherwise, we're not gonna get people the well-being and support that they need um, going forward in the future. Do, do, do you think, um, when, when you look at, I, I, I just want to you know, be a bit uh, personal and specific now. Yeah. When you look at the, the work of the journalists and broadcasters, yeah. um, do, do you see a risk here for? for of course, yes. of course. There's, there's, a risk, there's a risk in a couple of ways. One, we, <laughs> You guys, you guys are yes. hearing the stories. You guys are knowing intimately the details of what's going on. And unfortunately, um, you guys are the narrative piece of how people, the public understands these issues. So for instance, if you're reporting these issues in a way that's sensationalized, right? You can glorify certain types of behaviors and not. If you are reporting these issues, but not giving people the tools and techniques to get support, whether in terms of crisis hotlines, et cetera, um, if you're, um, not giving, if you're not giving um, realistic accounts, we said that one of the main issues when it comes to mental health is issue of stigma. The research supports that. 70% of Nigerians, according to another poll, believe that the number one idea around what a mental disease is, is someone running around naked. So in our popular understanding, it's someone on the street that needs or somebody hurting themselves but we know that people are facing like i said you know you see I'm you know, you, know you know why i ask I, yes. I, because i really want to know how we can manage it because we yeah. talked about you know the the t workplace you know um schedule yeah. scheduling uh the time you stay in the work our work is such that Stressful. we work we work even during holidays like you, yeah. during, you know, uh, emergency periods like COVID, we work, we don't have, you know, uh, uh, we, we don't go on holidays, we don't go on Christmas or whatever, yeah. you know, we don't take a break, we work long hours. So how can we manage, you These know, yes, yeah, so you want, you want yeah, to come? I'll, I'll take that too. I think um, sometimes it's very easy to journalists not also pay attention to the mental health. And I think just piggybacking off to what Chime said about um, trauma, secondary trauma for um, journalists, you were the ones that witnessed the information, witnessed things, sometimes your first-hand account of a lot of quite um, jarring experiences, even before we see it. You're always, you, you know, when yes. you talk about first-line respondents, especially in presenting the information, the, the journalists are always there. And sometimes also the type of information that you put out there can yes, also put your crazy. life um, you know, at risk. You can put your life at risk all the time. Um, personally, you know, I've also, I've also been in a space where we've worked with journalists, so I know that there's a lot of pressure that comes with being in your work. And because you see behind the scenes that most of us don't see, sometimes you filter the information you give us, um, you see the truth, you know the trends that are coming. So it's a lot of pressure, excuse me, it's a lot of pressure on journalists even. And so every time, and this is back to back for you, 
Mm. For, we, we can decide one day to turn off the TV and not listening, but you have no choice in your line of work because you have to keep doing it. So definitely self-care is very important. When you're even working in this year, um, in the line of work you do, I know you talk about the long hours, mm. you also need to take care of yourself. You need to take some breaks. It's very important. I think also it should be a systemic thing where you ensure that the people who are in the front line who are doing this work that can be very traumatic for them have some breaks. You need to take care of yourself. There need to be mechanisms for you to get that social support and that mental health support, emotional support if you do need it. If you go into a place where there is disaster, your safety, how is it, how is it um, made sure that you have safety, your healthcare concerns, your social support, is it provided for you? Because sometimes when... The organization provides these things for the professionals. There's one less thing to worry about and you're mm -hmm. able to do your work. Um, do you have access to care? Do you have access to support? I think it's also something that we should be infusing in the workplace mm -hmm. to support the staff. What, what amount of break would you recommend for those you know, journalists or broadcasters who work for a very long time? Yes. So again, it also depends on the organization. I will leave that to the organization to decide. Um, mm -hmm your leave periods how often do you take your leave you know most organizations give one hour break every nine to five working yeah. schedule so it depends on what your working schedule is but you need to also keep that um, time for a break depending on how your schedule is as journalists and how long you work for i think it would be different from the everyday nine to five person but i think it's very important to put in and ensure that measures are put in to protect the people that work for you because of the type of work they do um, and the space that they're in Thank All right, you. thank you. Uh, Dr. Abdul Malik, I know you were itching earlier to, yeah. uh, to <laughs> intervene. I, I don't know what exactly that is, but let's also uh, underscore the fact that there are other professional groups in occupations mm. that don't go on break. Mm. Policemen are yes. perpetually on the beat. Today, where you have the military in virtually all states of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory on routine security duties, uh, they are also uh, traumatized, and you, and you experts talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. Firemen and women don't also go on break. Uh, so you have these occupations, uh, and it's just the coping mechanisms that mm. uh, you, you reference. Dr. Malik, wanted to interject earlier. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, just to touch briefly on a number of the issues, let me start from women's mental health, because the menopause thing. Increasingly, women's mental health is now a big area in mental health because we know that there are unique conditions specific to women. There, is, there are things associated with onset of um, menstruation and some females have mood disorders around ovulation, around their menstrual period. So we have premenstrual syndrome, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, many other conditions like that. Not for everybody, but it's a unique thing for some women, and it can really be debilitating for them. Now, during pregnancy, during pregnancy and after delivery, there are unique challenges that can occur to women. Not just mental health challenges. Some women can develop hypertension because of pregnancy. Some women can become diabetic during pregnancy but they can also develop mental health issues because of the chemical change, the hormonal changes associated with pregnancy. And in, now it's even been increased to one year after delivery, perinatal mental health, to a period of pregnancy up to one year after delivery. So it's a big area, and then you mentioned menopause. So across the lifespan for females, they have unique challenges that is increasingly becoming a focus of attention and is receiving the attention it needs. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect Does to... Amugua also cause mental health? <laughs> no, Amugua doesn't cause... No, it, that's it, what I'm saying. It, it causes <laughs> mental stress for the abandoned husband. Oh, my God, you're jobless. <laughs> yeah. No, but... but, clear, but, clear. but no, 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 but, 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 but no, he's husband, an expert. The husband is also at liberty to go on Amugua. <laughs> no, 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 clear, clear. Don't, yes. Clear, clear. Yes. Clear. I'm sorry. Most times, they yes. choose not I, to. I agree, you I know, agree. They play the man but, thing. But, but, I was just riding on what Dr. Uh -huh. Malik was saying. He was saying the entire lifespan of a woman, uh -huh. you know, from puberty uh -huh. to uh, yes. uh, menopause, even post yes, menopause. Kingsley. So that's why I was saying that, you know, because part of what we are seeing now, I don't know whether that was part of the research finding, <laughs> that a postmenopausal life, a mugu factor, has also men, men, men don't go into <laughs> menopause, so don't even yes, argue. Andropos. Eh? Andropos There's what? Andropause in men, andropause. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, we, we, we just quickly, we, we have not forgotten, uh, of course, uh, Professor Schenge. Yeah, Schenge uh, in our Ibadan studio. We'll come to you shortly, but let's go on a short break. When we come back, we'll continue with this very, very important discussion on mental health. All right, you're welcome back. And it's still Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Now, let's uh, return to Professor Schenge, uh, who is a psychologist at our uh, Ibadan uh, Network Studios. Uh, Professor Schenge, a number of items have been on the, on, on the plate uh, since this conversation started. But let, let's also now begin to say, from uh, the psychological point of view, back again to that original, uh, if you like, uh, entry point for today's conversation. We are in tough times, but it is said that tough people uh, outlast tough times. What are the coping mechanisms that can be suggested uh, in, this, in this time so that we can mitigate the triggers for mental health issues across the spectrum? Thank you very much. Um... Well, you, you, you earlier mentioned something relating to poverty. You know, we can talk about poverty in terms of uh, money, in terms of uh, Naira and Kobo. But then there's an aspect of poverty I like talking about, which uh, people are not very familiar with. The poverty of ideas, workable ideas are that. Uh, when, when we have uh, ideas that are workable, and that means seeking knowledge about certain things that affect us then we are in a better position to navigate uh, some of the challenges that we have because ign ignorance can be a very big uh, uh, issue. Now that leads me to talk about you know, the way we, we generate a lot of tension, generate a lot of stress. When I look at Nigeria sometimes, in some cases, it looks like uh, you know, a good number of people know how to generate stress rather than doubt tension. Sometimes it happens at the, 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 the family level, sometimes at the work level, even sometimes at national level, uh, in terms of uh, the kind of uh, you know, thing that we do and say. So we need to uh, find ways of uh, uh, managing our stress you know, very well, productively. Manage stress productively in ways that will not generate uh, tension the more, uh, so that uh, um, the, the, the coping uh, will be much better and more realistic. And that, that, that leads me to talk about the, to talk about the, 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 the issue of uh, balancing. Balancing, there's something, for those who work, there's something called work-life balance. There's also what's called work-family balance. We have to balance these issues because work, the thing that happen, happens to a man or a woman at home can be carried over to workplace and to other places. And so we need to balance all of these things. So someone was talking about the, 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 uh, the different professionals that don't even have time to go on break. Journalists, military people, policemen, and others. Uh, these are critical things that authorities really need to understand and deal with. Um, uh, for instance, uh, when people uh, who are maybe military people or, or police personnel, maybe they have a critical situation, in a critical situation, they want to go on a leave or get a pass and they um, if uh, someone said, no, you cannot get, get a pass, I, you cannot get a pass to even attend your mother's barrier, to attend your, your father's barrier, to attend. Uh, when these things accumulate over time, you know, it, it can weigh a person down, no matter how strong that person is. So we have to relate with this. Uh, the authorities should know that uh, uh, these people are human beings, they are not iron, uh, so they can, they can be weighed down. Uh, so the, 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 the humane treatment has to be meted out to them in terms of uh, understanding the things that are happening to them, listening to them. Uh, the, the era of uh, uh, you know, people saying generally, even in, in military and paramilitary circle, that, oh, obey before complain uh, is gradually winning because sometimes if you want to obey before complain, then in some cases you will find the person, the complainant or the potential complainant dead. So he's not even alive again to complain. So sometimes we have to listen and listen very well and figure out what should be done. Uh, be realizing that uh, people who are working have families, people who are working have their own concerns and so on. They can be weighed down. And these things are not taken care of. Uh, it, can, it can upset 
relationship at work. As you see, sometimes you hear of a, 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 maybe a, 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 an officer you know, uh, taking out a, a firearm to shoot a, 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 a superior who denied him uh, of uh, something. So these things uh, um, uh, 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 are a kind of warning uh, to us that uh, we should listen to what uh, uh, people uh, have to say. Nothing weighs a person down uh, more than uh, not being allowed to even uh, express himself or herself at least to be heard because as it is generally said talking itself is healing when people talk and express themselves they are in a way healed even before the real solution comes to them so we need to know how to balance things we need to have to understand uh, the things that uh, we do we need to uh, uh, bring back uh, on the board issues of uh, empathy uh, many people are, are, are no longer empathetic uh, these days uh, so uh, you, 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 you know that what is happening to you is not good, but you do not know that this same thing will happen to another person and the person will feel it uh, in a very negative way. So we have to understand uh, our situation. We have to uh, uh, train people, uh, professionals that can deal with this issue very well. We have to, uh, we have to uh, understand that mental health is something, it's just like a, 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 a somatic health. Anybody, as I said earlier, anybody can be sick, mentally uh, sick. So we have to do away with the stigma. We have to provide so social support uh, that the people need. Government can provide uh, support. Uh, 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 family members can provide support. Uh, other people at work can provide support. So all of Professor Schenge, thank you. Um, let's get back to the studio. Uh, Chime, I I'm just wondering again, we, we link mental health you know, with poverty and all that. Uh, but most cases now, uh, do not really reflect that because if you find um, the, the the number of you know cases, they are you know more within the those in the entertainment you know uh, cycle, and you even see young you know young boys and girls you know come down with um, you know very serious mental health health problems. Yes, I mean how 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 can we understand that? How do we relate that? I think that there's there's a a lot of things, as um, um, Chidi Chim. said, you know, young adolescence is when you identify a lot of mental health challenges, yes. especially when people face the growing stresses of life. So there's a reason why when, whether in university or in the workplace, mm -hmm. you start seeing a lot of mental health issues develop, right? It's one of the reasons why is because there's a new land of stress and that people are trying to contend with. And also people are in new environments, if that makes sense. They're, whether it's new people that define themselves, they're not in the household, they need their It's a different reflective space. So you're going to have those challenges. But there's different things that can happen to help support individuals. And I really think that it's a clearing call on government to see how they can help get support in the hands they need. So whether you're an entertainer or a young person, you need to be able to seek a mental health specialist in your community. One of the ways that will help that is the Mental Health Act. As you know, um, a lot of the people who are on this uh, show today help get the Mental Health Act passed in a multi-sectoral coalition. So mm. that's first to emphasize what Dr. Um, from Ibadan is saying is that we need to make sure that when we think about mental health specialists, everybody's at the table. Psychiatrists, psychologists, lay counselors, lawyers, act, occupational what, what, therapists. What do you even get to see? Is it a psychologist? Is it a psychiatrist? Because when you talk it's, about psychiatrists, it's, it's, people get, ah, I know they go here, psychiatrists yes. are for mad people. It's, so it's, it's, it's different based on the spectrum, right? It could be one of the things that the Mental Health Act is, has is not only psych mental health specialists, right, and trying to mainstream mental health at the local communities, but it also says there should be peer support workers because it's also important for individuals to face someone who's also dealing what they're dealing with, right? So it's called lived experience experts. If I have a mental health condition and it's bipolar or ADHD or we've been talking about menopause and mm -hmm. things like that, I can talk to you about my experience in a way that you can connect with it. You can rate relate to it and you can see it's not that bad mm -hmm. or this is how I've dealt with it. But we need to make sure we enfranchise the Mental Health Act. And so we passed, the, officially the act was passed December 30th. We're in Q4 and we haven't seen, even though the government is doing a lot of efforts like trying to create a mental health roadmap, we haven't seen some of the main institutions created. There's three institutions that are supposed to be created for the Mental Health Act. One is a mental health assessment committee that's supposed to enfranchise the human rights of individuals. 
There's supposed to be a mental health fund because we can't, with all these things, if we don't have financing in the space, nothing will happen. Mental health is only 2.9% of the entire health budget. And we think about the right to health being physical, mental, and social. So it's a fraction of what it should be. And the most important thing is we need a department of mental health because we need something to coordinate the activities of the Mental Health Act. And that hasn't happened. We will not advance the Mental Health Act if we don't create a Department of Mental Health. So this is a, a call for all the male, well meaning The Department of Mental Health, where? In the Federal Ministry of Health. There okay. should be a Department of Mental Health created, yeah, well, and we haven't had that um, set up yet. Sorry. If we want to really uh, mainstream the Mental Health Act, we need to make sure the department is created. Chime, Chime, thank, thank you very much. Dr. Abdul Malik, I know that you also spoke about this uh, while the uh, legislation was in the crucible. Uh, which leads us to uh, two things now, if you still, uh, both of you either, you, you want to make a comment still on safe coping mechanism with uh, stress generators so that you can uh, mitigate uh, mental health issues. And then available institutional and governmental support to uh, enable us deal with mental health issues much more readily effectively and efficiently. And in answering this question, you may wish to advert your mind to whether policymakers, PEPs, politically exposed persons, and those in authority have, have started opening uh, their iris, as it were, to the issue of mental health. Are they getting sensitized about mental health issues, or do they just see it as mad people, as ordinary people will see them? Dr. Malik, let's begin with you. Thank Quickly. you very much. Uh, now, this is actually where the rubber meets the road because we have to, we can talk all day, but actions need to be taken. These are clear and present danger because in all of this, we've not even spoken about drug abuse and we are sitting on a keg of gunpowder for our youths with respect to drug abuse. So, mental health is a big problem. It's a looming crisis and unfortunately, the government is not, does not yet appear to be fully sensitized as to the magnitude of the problem on our hands. And this is at all tiers of government, at federal level, at state level, and at the local government level. I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of states that have even desk officer, one person in the State Ministry of Health for Mental Health. At the Federal Ministry of Health until about 15 years ago, there was no desk officer for mental health. Now we have one person, mental health coordinator, and that is grossly insufficient, as Chime was saying. We need a department, at the, that is at federal level. Remember, WHO defines health as physical, mental, and social. Each of these three components accounts for one third of health. And then an entire one third, 33.3%, is not reckoned with at all at policy level. So if it's not there at the table, of course there'll be no planning for it. There'll be no programs for it. Several states, just about five out of 36 states, have desk officers for mental health, one person designated for mental health. That is grossly insufficient. We need this to happen in all states because an integral part of health. So we need our policymakers. We have a new government in town. We have new ministers in place. We have new leadership in the National Assembly. We hope that they will be sensitized to the fact that mm -hmm. the third sustainable development goal, health and well-being for all, must include mental health. Mm -hmm. And so, we need to pay attention to it. So this now challenges access, management and treatment of people who have you know, mental uh, health conditions. So, usually, um, some of them, you know, are given some suppressants or, or relaxants. I don't know. What should be the first, you know, uh, uh, port of call if you suspect that you have, you know, mental health condition? Um, Where do you go to? So, a lot of people, what we always encourage to do, go to the hospital. Go to your hospital, go to the, you know, your primary care hospital. The idea is also that at your primary care hospital, the person who sees you makes a referral to the specialist um, who can also be there to support you. For a lot of people, going to the hospital is the easiest thing to do, so I encourage you to start with going to the hospital. Um, it's supposed to be that when the person goes there, 
there's the care that is given to them there's the referral that is made based on the needs the person presents with not everybody would need psychiatric care sometimes some people need to speak with the psychologist they might need to speak with the social worker um, so when you go there the idea is that you have those resources available but is that what happens all the time no so like we always try to advocate in most primary health care centers we do not have people we do not have mental health professionals that are available to support people so that's why you see them look for means from anywhere and everywhere so part of what we talk about in the mental health act is establishing these systems having personnel on ground at primary health care centers let's even start with the basics at your local level mm -hmm. having people that are there that are trained that understand what to look out for that know the questions <coughs> to ask that would help you say okay this is what you need and this is the right care you need if you have people addressing if you go to treat an eye problem and you're seeing a dentist you're not going to get the right care mm -hmm. so that's why we say when you go to the place when you go to a hospital where you're supposed to get the right care i think again why we and why we keep on speaking about the act and speaking about this is because we need this personnel we have this japa syndrome affecting everybody your practitioners are leaving even down to your lay counselors um, everybody is leaving so it's like we have to look at we have to look at the training we have to look at the capacity of the professionals that are available and we have to ensure that we have these people there at the places that that they need to go to so that they get the right care that they deserve okay, we have just less than three minutes yeah, yeah. Doctor, yes. Abdul yes. Oh, oh, doctor i don't what's chime and abdul malik abdul malik first right please uh whatever you, else you want to add what is the challenge with uh, getting policy makers, lawmakers, uh, and those in authority to be attuned to the necessity of responding to mental health issues in Nigeria? I think the challenge is priority and getting access to them. They don't see it as a priority. That is the major challenge and they need to see it. And the other thing is that we don't see that mental health is in everything. Someone has cancer, a diagnosis of cancer. The person is going to be depressed and anxious. Yes. A woman is battling with infertility. She's going oh. to be anxious and depressed. It's in everything that is health. But even health generally is given very low priority by our politicians, our political leaders, and that is terrible. So that's it. Now, what I wanted to add about access to care, psychological care, is that we don't even need to reinvent the wheel. We don't, need, we don't have enough professionals. We are not going to recruit professionals from Jupiter. We have laws that are not being implemented, policies. When Professor Oluko Iransom Kutu was Minister of Health in 1991, mental health was included as the ninth component of primary care. Every primary care worker receives some basic training on mental health. Now we can argue that the training is grossly insufficient and outmoded, but we can improve that training so that the same way you can go to your PHC for antenatal care, for malaria treatment, it's the same way you should be able to get mental health care. And we call on the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, and they have representatives in every state. This is their responsibility. Health is, mental health is your ninth pillar of primary care. But we know that they don't have the expertise, they are not doing it. We need to not reinvent the wheel, but mm -hmm. operationalize what is already in existence. In existence. Okay, Chime, quickly. Yeah. Yes, what I was going to say is that we're talking about coping, but to get to true coping, people are always going to be challenged. And one of the first steps to coping is how you deal with the first responders. Usually it's a police officer or a medical official if you're having a challenge, the first person you meet. But right now, the law says that if someone does something like has a psychotic episode, has attempt suicide, they're detained and jailed. Unfortunately, that's a law. According to the criminal penal code, you can be jailed for up to a year. So if we want to get people the help they need, the coping, we need to make sure that if they're in these situations, they can get support and not put in jail. So we need to decriminalize attempted suicide. The World Health Organization says that those who want to get help talk to their friends, their families, their medical specialists are afraid because of things that criminalize suicide. So if we want our policymakers to listen, not only do we have to mental, implement the Mental Health Act, mainstream mental health and things like 
the primary health care that the doctor was saying, but also the insurance scheme so people can pay for it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But we also need to make sure that we create a department that will push these issues because we don't even have the infrastructure to push it. And then we don't have the regulatory environment that supports individuals who are caught up in the stresses of life because we criminalize attempted suicide. So there's a lot of quick wins. And the last thing I'll say is this. Mental health is one of those things that people don't gravitate to easier. You're really pulled into it. I think one of the challenges that people, politicians don't put themselves in people's shoes because of the stigmatized version of it. So I think it's incumbent on them to have conversations with us as leaders and stakeholders so we can help this country with mental health and well-being going and, and, the and then they would see they would see for instance that yes while we need infrastructure the bridges that you are constructing are now becoming hotspots for attempted suicide <laughs> yes. indeed uh, indeed very very salient uh, Kingsley, thank you. Chime Aswanye, JD founder, Nigeria Mental Health. Uh, We'd like to thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, Has anyone ever told you that you seem to be a darker version of uh, Ngilai Liajuri? I haven't heard that. (laughs) You haven't heard that? I've heard it today. (laughs) But you said you're going to let us say about people who want resources. (laughs) www.nigeriamentalhealth.org. If you want crisis support, you can visit our website. We have hotlines. If you need support for your well-being or if you feel like you're having an emergency situation. Thank you, Chime. And uh, let me also appreciate Chinyarugu Onyekwara, clinical psychologist, name foundation. Chinyare, thank, thank you very much for, you for sharing your me. perspective. And um, I also would like to appreciate Dr. Uh, Jibril Abdul-Malik, consultant, psychiatric, psychiatrist and founder at SIDO Foundation. Thank you very much for all you do. Uh, you Professor... Professor Yito Alexander Schenge, Professor of Psychology, University of Ibado. Uh, of course, a Professor of Industrial Organizational Psychology, Pioneer Chairman of the Nigerian Psychological Association. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us all the way from our Ibado studio. All right, and that's it for us. And good morning, Nigeria, for today, Friday. We thank you for watching. On behalf of the GMN crew, I am Claire Adilabu Abdurazak. Have a pleasant weekend. Enjoy your weekend as well, but look after yourselves. I'm Kingsley Osadolo.